So last time I saw you, we were in Austin, Texas, <laughs> and you were uh, just on the near other side of uh, divorce. Yeah. And kind of processing that in your life. Where are you today, Kelly Brogan? Yeah. So and that's what I was telling you before we started rolling is that I was watching a clip from that interview and I could just see like this layer on top of my literal face, like my my eyes and my mouth, just this, I could see my own grief, you know, in my face. And I feel so different now. I mean, it's not even a meritocracy. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm better and I'm so spiritually enlightened now, you know? But I just, I feel so much more in my flesh, like so much more in my skin. And it's been um, really like an extraordinary whatever it's been, year and a half, something like that, uh, of time with myself, you know, time understanding what happens inside of my systems when I like create the container um, and let the energy flow through me. I mean, it sounds cliche, right? But I know you really, we were talking about like celibate windows and I mean, the creative life force that I have experienced, like I've learned how to dance and sew and sing. And I mean, all of these different, you know, professional entrepreneurial endeavors and experiences of myself as a mother, these, it's archetypal play, you know, that I haven't um, really explored when I've been coupled. And I think it's been the opportunity for me to really um, like marry my polarities within and we're talking about this event I have coming up and how much uh, in, in Miami in November, it's my first live event ever. And it it feels like, I was like, wow, this feels a lot like the other professional projects, you know, I've put together that are like business driven. It feels like a celebration and it feels like the marriage of my parts for everyone to see, you know, my dark parts, my taboo dimensions, my light parts, my exalted you know, sort of matriarchal dimensions and they're all coming together and I'm inviting a bunch of women to celebrate with me. <laughs> so that feels like a culmination and that'll be, uh, I guess, two years, yeah, post that um, major wow. diversions for me. Many of us at the demise of a relationship tend to just brush ourselves off and jump into another one, um, which probably works sometimes, not in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what prompted your decision to take some time off from that and just go within and really work on the relationship with yourself. Mm. I'd like to say it was like some conscious intentional choice, but I think it was more born of how consuming being with my emotional experience. And I had already done enough um, self-committing, I guess, up until that point to know that whatever was happening inside of me was something I wasn't going to avoid. Um, and actually, probably since I've seen you, you know, I'm, I've stopped drinking, working with any plant medicines, like I have just been here with myself. And uh, the culmination of which was probably um, a water only fast in silence in my home, which was one of the more <laughs> nihilistic experiences of my life, just to literally be with myself sipping water on a couch for nine days. Wow. Holy fuck. That was, um, <laughs> it was like I met the part of me that doesn't want to be incarnate, you know, like it was really one of the harder things I've ever done. I'm still recovering from it, actually, I would say like a year later. But I, uh, I was very consumed by what it was to just literally work through the, the dimensions of like rage and, you know, um, sadness and grief and I really ultimately got to this this shame wall just so much energy locked up behind a lot of shame and it was almost like I was invited um, by my inner child parts I guess but like invited into these uh, space, almost like tricked into these spaces like I found myself in a pole dance class suddenly you know or I found myself like 
making like some silly comedic video I never would otherwise have put together and, you know, just post it. It's fun. Look what you did. And, you know, found myself taking like a voice lesson, like a singing lesson and under the guise of it's being just something new to try. But what actually I was confronted with through those experiences was like tremendous amounts of shame. I mean, I would, I remember being in like one of my first singing lessons and just like these hot tears coming down my face. I didn't even know why, you know, I'm sitting here with this lovely woman and she's encouraging me to like open this up for myself and legitimizing my entitlement to claim this, you know, feminine gift that every, every person, but every woman certainly has and uh, as a birthright. And I just felt like crumbling into a ball and disappearing. I mean, what is that? <laughs> right? And and I worked through a lot of that energy as I began to explore exotic dance and then, you know, was attracted to BDSM as like a culture and explored a lot of um, what people are up to in that realm, you know, not through my direct lived, you know, experience necessarily, but it just started to really um, orient me towards what I had been hiding, um, like my secret self, I would call it, and also how much energy I had been putting into curating um, and performing and therefore not being in this vessel, not being present in my experience, not being present to whomever was in front of me and really hoping nobody would notice like these other parts that were not in mastery, right? Like these other dimensions of myself that um, were very alive, but not necessarily like part of my sense of identity and self-concept. So that was pretty time consuming and energetically consuming too. And I just knew like I'm not, I was not in my like, ripened self to bring wholeness and the potential for intimacy yet. Um, And so this experience of like growing my maturing, I would say, my inner masculine to hold space for that embarrassment, the shame, the sense of what are you doing? You're making a fool of yourself. You can't come back from this. Like you've undermined everything you've built. (laughs) You know, now you don't have a man to tell you not to do the thing, the stupid things you know, this, this spine grew inside of me that was like, no, baby, I got you, (laughs) you know, and I love what you're up to. I'm here for it. And I'm not going to let you do anything that is going to be out of alignment. And with that sense of I've got me, um, I began to restore a connection to my own impulses, you know, my own biological impulses. I mean, literally I spent months working on just relating to like peeing differently, meaning like, you know, you know what? It started on your podcast. The last time I was on your podcast, I'm happy I peed, to hear that. I peed on your podcast. I literally got up and peed. And that was the first time. It was so fucking long. It was like I remember three hours that. or some shit. No, I remember that. Yeah. At I one point up, you're right? like, hey, I, I know. I had never done that before. And since that time, I I thought for a second you meant like you peed in your pants. I was (laughs) like, wow, you you hit it. Well, cool, cool. Yeah. No, it was just beginning to recognize that my body matters, what my body tells me matters. And I'm going to, you know, not say things like I'm going to go pee quick. You know, I'll be right back. I'm going to just honor that, right? Like I, I will be that husband to myself who creates the conditions for my impulses to be taken care of, for them to matter. And that extended into like creative realms where then I began to have, you know, inspiration and um, a sense of like, I don't know, this, this creative open channel and that, you know, reconnection to my desire as being like a, a sacred force within me. And what do I want? What feels good? You know, like, how do I make myself even more comfortable? I asked you guys to turn the air conditioning off before this. I wouldn't have done that before. And now it matters to me. My comfort matters. My experience of like um, setting the conditions for my energy to, you know, move within me. And so that sort of like inner maturation within me, I feel is what has readied me for a partnership in a way that had I just, you know, 
I don't know, attracted an unavailable man to do the dance, right? We're talking about the love addiction dance. Um, it would have been a grand expression of ongoing, you know, codependency and self-avoidance and self-interference. So it's been, um, it's been, yeah, very rich dimensional time for me. Yeah, dating yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, man. Fuck, it can get lonely, but you know, there, there's a north star, right? It, it, it's serving a purpose. You're, uh, you're creating that diamond. That's been actually, you know, I, I spent a lot of years as an atheist. Um, really, I was raised Catholic by my dad. My mom was an atheist. Um, and I decided not to be confirmed at whatever it is, like 12 or 13. And that was a big deal. And I became very devoted, you know, like Dawkins, selfish gene, Darwinism, kind of like real scientism practicing. It was the, the roots of my scientism, you know, devotional practice for the ensuing decades started in my adolescence. And you know, then when I began to wake up, probably around the time of my first uh, pregnancy, I, you know, I woke up into the new age. Like, so I woke up into the universe, right? And this this concept of like general meaning making and spiritualism and became a Kundalini Yoga, you know, teacher, practitioner and found a lot of beauty and um, animism, you know? And I still was in like a spiritual meritocracy, a will-based world where if Kelly wanted something, she had to make it happen by aligning herself and doing the inner work. And uh, if it didn't yeah. happen, it meant that Kelly wasn't, you know, getting an A plus on her like spiritual work. Um, and so more recently, I've been in this moment of my life where I'm neutralizing a lot of rejection energy. And I have had a very, what I would call an immature masculine, like a very sort of like rule book, hard lines, um, you know, sort of like, fuck no to a lot of things. Like, no, Kelly doesn't do that. You know, pharma, certain foods, you know, sort of all the, the bad list. And it, even in holistic wellness, right? We can get into that, that split of of good and bad, and we empower the enemy, you know, eroticize the enemy, I would say. And I, I really have come to a moment where one of the things that I'm revisiting in, the, in an effort to find neutrality is, uh, is organized religion. And, and like, what do I think about Jesus? And what do I think about, you know, Christianity? Where did I leave off there? And what was this journey I've been on? Because in my exploration of, of, Dom sub dynamics and and polarity dynamics. You know, I consider like a Christian woman, let's say, who's walking the world and she believes in a masculine, you know, God energy. And it's all around her. This safe, trustworthy, noble, honorable masculine energy. I mean, she's literally suffused with it. That confers something to her nervous system that I don't enjoy <laughs> in my new age spirituality, right? Uh, I, I am still in my defensive structure, making things happen and not trusting a process. And I'm interested in what it is to shift into this sense of like submission that is available to men and women, right? Because many... Um, Professional doms would say, you know, they are submissive to God, right? So there is a hierarchy, you know, from God to man to woman to child. And that finding your place in that hierarchy and how you can access submission, it does something to your system that allows it to exhale appropriately, right? And when you're in this, the universe has got me, I don't know, it doesn't do that for it's me. A little ambiguous. It's not a masculine <laughs> energy, right? It's a little, yeah, right? yeah, it's a little yeah. androgynous. And so I've been curious about, you know, how is it that I can find real trust and real surrender? And part of it is knowing that, you know, partnership and marriage on a new level um, that I now understand, you know, having been married 
and divorced twice, I have a special insight into what it is to not fully understand, you know, what the marriage covenant, and I'm not speaking from a legal perspective, obviously, but what it represents as being, you know, the historical impulse for all of human culture, you know, between man and woman, let's say. Um, And so for me to know that's awaiting me is a trust exercise of enormous proportions. And there are other tests in life that offer that moment of choice where you're either going to really allow the plot (laughs) to unfold and love the story, you know, for whatever it exposes, or you are going to insist on writing it. Right? And every page you're going to scribble out and rewrite it and try to guess what you're going to write five pages later, um, you know, five pages later. And um, I think this is my initiation, you know, on a feminine level into what it is to submit to God, you know, and I haven't really had that experience. I've been through some challenging moments and several dark nights, actually, that have brought me to my knees. Um my divorce being one of them, and maybe the cardinal one. However, I haven't found that um, relationship to desire, right? It's been more that charnel ground of like just being ripped into like shreds or pixelated into the abyss, you know? I've known that space. But as, as I relate to my own desire, I haven't come into that level of vulnerability that says like, I know how to hold this, you know, like David Data calls it the the feminine signature of being full and wanting more. You know, I had a um, Qigong teacher, Ming Tang Gu, who taught me this Chinese word, haola, and it's like all is well and getting better, right? So how can we hold that paradox, which perhaps is the feminine essence that says like, this is, this is everything I've ever wanted <laughs> like right here. And it's, also um, a yearning that is so, so deep within me for more. Beautiful. Yeah. So it's oh. been a, pro- <laughs> a process of <laughs> orienting myself you know, yeah. to that. That brings to my awareness, uh, you know, the principle of surrender, which to me has been the key to any semblance of fulfillment, joy, rest, purpose. It's all in surrender. But as you spoke on that, I I don't know if I ever thought about that in order for one to fully surrender, there has to be something or someone to surrender into, right? Someone has to hold you. I I can't surrender to the void. There's nothing there to surrender to, right? There has to be a presence. And um, thinking back in my time spent um, in the throes of addiction and just complete self-will and egoic identity and living like an instinct driven animal that I did for so long, there was no possibility of surrender because there's nothing to surrender to, right? Until all of that had failed. And then it was like, okay, well, I'm still not going to surrender, but I'm open to exploring that there might be something out there other than myself and the limited power that I contain as a single individual, you know? And man, surrender is just, it's everything, but it's also something uh, that doesn't have a uh, a finite conclusion, right? It's not like, oh, I surrendered. Yeah, I, I turned my life <laughs> over to, to God and we're, we're, everything's good now, right? There's all these micro surrenders that come as we meet up against the degree of trust that we have in it, you know? Do you find that your degree of trust and your ability to surrender goes incrementally in terms of um, things that are more substantial and that you're clinging to harder versus things that are easier. Oh, my car got repossessed. I'll surrender to that. But like taxes, divorce, illness, right? I think that's when we meet the real test of like, how surrendered am I really? And how much of my like God spark can I connect to in the moments where I feel most unworthy, right? Because we ha- all have our portal, right? Whether it's illness or conception or, you know, meaning, you know, trying to have a family or whether it's um, 
loss, we have the portal through which we feel potentially forsaken, you know, and in that moment of disconnection, you know, you know, me, I would probably argue that most of what we call mental illness is, you know, shades of disconnection from your divine nature and your divine source. And that moment of contact with that forsaken um, experience is probably by design so that you can find it anew, right? But find it through your own will through your own choice and through the experience of like spiritual courage that it takes to like reclaim your life force from this um, familiar and seemingly uh, soothing dimension of poor me victimhood, right? Because it's a lot of what I focus on is like how what we have and what we're experiencing has very narratively important meaning in our in our life journey and that there are m- many ways that our needs are met through our victimhood through our experience of ourselves as um, having been forsaken poor me why me I hate this why is this always happening and ultimately what that means is like I'm not worthy right I'm not worthy and so I would only not have what I want everything that I want you know all the beauty and the money and the children and the friends and the lovers and all the things that I want if I am unworthy of them, right? If I don't deserve them. And because we're raised in these households where we're enculturated around this idea that you have to deserve love, you have to earn love, you have to um, meet the criteria for, you know, security and uh, safety and emotional attachment, We bring that into all these dimensions of our lives. And perhaps we have these dark, dark moments where we are presented with the opportunity to recruit courage and choose life, like choose to reconnect and choose to find um, our sense of worth, even in defiance of like what we may be observing around ourselves. And that's where, yeah, like, I don't know, surrender to me doesn't look like oh, whatever, it'll come when it comes, you know? It's it's working with every moment of upset. I call it entering through the upset. It's like working through every single moment and understanding that like the feelings of upset, the disappointment, the resentment, the fear, the frustration um, is like, a, it's a rich energetic terrain within which I can make contact with a part of myself that holds like a gift. And I can do that literally through the animation and choice to embrace the emotional experience. Like I'm big on disappointment. That's like my favorite feeling. I was so fetishized in in Kelly's world. It's like, I love feeling disappointed. Is part of that because it provides you the opportunity to choose essence over perception? Meaning when one is disappointed, it's, in my experience, because I'm framing what was supposed to be in a certain light rather than the essence of what, what, it, what is. it actually is. Yeah. yeah, And the humility to know, I don't know the way it's supposed to look, right? Which is easy to do in hindsight. You can look back on anything. You look back on a divorce, on a whatever, someone died. I mean, the most tragic things in life, for the most part, outside of maybe war and famine and all the real nasty stuff, but just in your subjective experience, Inevitably, you're going to look back and go, oh, okay, I see why that job didn't work out or why that business failed or whatever. And it was for me and not to me and all of that. But it's it's much more difficult to have a grasp on the essence and the truth of something in the moment because of all of the emotionality And projections, of it. Yeah. right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my my... Best girlfriend, Tara. You know Tara. Yeah, Tara. We went to Mexico together. Yes, yeah, so she's she, great. Where does she live these days? LA. She's oh, she's still LA. there? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and she um, she coined this term I love, which could apply to any, you know, any situation. She's like, there he is again. There she is again, right? Just like say that to yourself every time you're in the fetishized cycle of being disappointed again that somebody is doing the thing again. Right? Oh, there he is again. 
There he is. That's actually who he is. It's who he's always shown me he is, or she, or it, government, or whatever, pharma, right? Like, there pharma is again, right? Doing pharma's thing, right? Instead of this like, oh, it's like a tantrum. It's like, oh my God, again, (laughs) right? And we enjoy, I believe, that experience of being right about how wronged we are um, trying to buy eggs from the hardware store, like doing the thing we know is not available, sourcing the love from the place we know it's not for sale, you know? And maybe we do it because it's very vivifying, like the ex- the feeling of disappointment. And, you know, I experience this a lot in business, like a vendor will disappoint me or somebody will not come through on something or they'll be delayed or they'll get overwhelmed and I don't want to hear about their overwhelm or whatever. And the feeling in my body is like, there's a lot of sensation, right? And so a lot of the work I've done, you know, with my coach Whitney and otherwise it's like to find the pleasure in the sensations of experiencing reality as I hate it to be, you know? And also with disappointment, it's like, there's a relinquishing. There's like, well, that didn't work, you know? And in that is like just a little taste of, forced surrender, right? Like a little taste of like, oh, well, now there's nothing to do because it doesn't work, didn't work. And now I'm just going to sit here, (laughs) right? And like, you know, and we can't consciously offer ourselves bodily arousal through pleasure, excitement, bliss, ecstasy, expansion. When we can't consciously offer ourselves, you know, the deliciousness of rest and you know, doing nothing, then we create these situations where we get to like micro visit with the spectrum, you know? And I, um, I also think there's a lot of fear, right? Like the thwarted desire for what is wanted is the experience of it can't happen. I don't deserve it. I can't have it. It's not here for me. Right. And so when we when we haven't healed that relationship to desire, then we just keep experiencing our desires thwarted. Right. I don't get to have the amazing team supporting me. I don't get to have, you know, the woman by my side, you know, in my darkest. Instead, I have, you know, the friend who disappoints me. Right. So we can we can create um, that mitigated dynamic with desire through disappointment or resentment. I mean, how many couples live in the resentment space of contempt, you know, just really, really um, getting off on the experience of repetitive patterned contempt in their body instead of the arousal that's available through polarity and, you know, a woman's proper submission, dare I say. Oh, you just pissed off a lot of feminists. <laughs> I don't know if any fem- quasi-feminists, rather. Uh, I don't know how many listen to this show at this point. I am a white male, after all. Yes, Therefore, in your privileged position. Yeah, in my privileged position. I think about that privilege thing. It's funny, you know, because everyone experiences their own traumas, capital T or lowercase t, subjectively, right? Like I like to refer to Bob Marley. I don't know if this is what he meant, but this is how I took it. <laughs> Every man's burden is the heaviest, right? It's like you were the ignored middle child. You have your own trauma that might be, um, you know, sins of omission rather than commission and not overtly visible to those about you, right? But you still experienced it as that. But <laughs> in terms of privilege, like no one escapes I mean, maybe a few do. No one I hang out with escaped trauma, right? Regardless of what their socioeconomic situation was or race or whatever. It's like you get fucking banged around when you're a kid, kind of by default, you know, unless you happen to be karmically bestowed with a really healthy, well-developed family unit. But I I think that- Have you met one of those people? (laughs) No, I don't think I have. But I think I also, water seeks its own level, right? So people I hang around, like we've been through some shit and that's one of the unifying aspects of what draws us together and makes us able to relate, you know? But yeah, I just an offshoot, just thinking about that. Whenever I hear someone talk about like, and I'm, you know, obviously there are, 
there are opportunities afforded to people that aren't afforded to others. Like I'm not dumb, but when I think about my own life, like, man, I've been, I've been through some shit, you know, was I like for a big one, I'll just say it. I've contemplated this. The Probably the most harmful thing that ever happened to me was being sexually abused when I was a little boy. Was I chosen because I was a white boy? Like maybe I, that wouldn't have happened if I was a brown boy. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's just theorizing, right? But like, where's, where's the privilege in that? And, and maybe that was more likely to happen because I lived in a really poor neighborhood and it had a lower level of consciousness in general. And there was probably more of that kind of nasty behavior going on. But it certainly, like being a white male, didn't make me immune to being harmed. You know, totally. And when you get into that comparative mentality, you know, as a psychiatrist working with women for ten years in New York City, who to a woman were subjected to like devastating levels of abuse and sexual abuse, every single patient I worked with, wow. and some. Some so dramatic that I, you know, I could, I could barely tell you without crying, you know, like what some of these women had gone through. The comparative hierarchy of trauma, right? Where I would say, wow, what some of these women have been through uh, was why I never spoke about my childhood experience, thinking like, well, I haven't been through that, so it must not matter. Plus, I was you know, trained in a, a a system that was really not trauma-informed, um, despite being like rather Freudian, you know, in, in at um, Cornell and NYU where I, where I was trained, there wasn't an understanding that it really matters for everyone, you know, the way it does now for better or for worse, because now there's a lot of victim coddling and there's a lot of virtue signaling and there's a lot of like, <laughs> right? Like you have to create the conditions for safety for me right. because of my trauma, right? So there's certainly a shadow of what's happening in the zeitgeist right now. However, this understanding that, you know, our emotions are an energetic resonance. When you feel grief and I feel grief, it's grief. <laughs> it's the signature of grief, right? And the narrative, the meaning that we make around it is our own personal narrative. And that's what really infuses the, the principal emotion with the capacity to disempower us over a lifetime and attract more and more and more of that same resonance and then amplify it and create a huge field that becomes almost like a, a louche field, like almost this ritualistic space that demands more and more and more of its own energy, you know? So you can have the same or worse of a on the books objective traumatic experience. And if you make it mean something less disabling, less condemning uh, than I do, right? Then you will go through your life being a match to very different um, circumstances. Or being so, a re reaction to it right. and perpetuating the same cycle, right? right. As, the, as the perpetrator. Right. And that's a lot of the parasitic dynamics of that victim field. It's like you end up needing to uh, play both sides. That's a lot of what I've learned in, through family constellation therapy, which has been so transformational for me, uh, is that I find parts of myself that otherwise would have remained hidden in my unexamined stories of my experiences of trauma, maybe unshared stories even, uh, when I see myself in the perpetrator, right? So a lot of what I've learned through Family Constellation is that the most powerful thing you can do is organize yourself relative to your perpetrator. And that can be a real live human or it can be a system right? It can be whatever it is that you've empowered as the enemy. And how can you literally look in the eyes of that representative and see yourself in that person? It's always possible. It's actually more readily available than we might ever comfortably admit. And in that, you reclaim your humility and you reclaim the part of yourself that would have remained behind that shame wall. 
hidden forevermore and projected onto all of your so-called enemies with different faces and different shapes for the rest of your life where you're just in that eroticized woundology, you know, just feeling. <laughs> eroticized it's, it's right, because if you like think that. about that. You come up with some good phrases. <laughs> That's cool. And if you think about like our eros as our vital life force, then we want to feel it. We want to be animated by it. And so we're going to attract the experiences that give us that flavor, give us that movement and and kinesis. And we're going to either do it through, you know, lovemaking and polarized dynamics, or we're going to do it through our struggles. In my own relationship with um, victimhood at large, not in immediate relationships because I thankfully don't put myself in a position to be, you know, intimately victimized by anyone, um, at least not in a long time. But thinking about um, the bad actors of the world, like the the people pulling the strings, the shadowy figures, um, sometimes I feel both resentment, you know, condemnation, blame, but on the other side of that also fearful and victimized, right? And one of the things I do, and I want to see if this relates to the model that you're kind of describing here. So take someone that I perceive to be inherently evil, a Bill Gates, a Klaus Schwab, a Tony Fauci, whoever. And my immediate reaction is probably, fuck them, anger. I want to see harm bestowed upon them. (laughs) I want them to be ended, right? But then if I look deeper, it's like, well, I'm afraid of them, really, right? So that's more in like getting into the victim mode. And then I find a way out of that, or at least maybe a level of above that is to ask the question, you know, who, who hurt you? Who hurt them? Right? Like this is a, an expression of God ultimately that for some reason has chosen to move away from that light and has lost their access to empathy and love and compassion and all the things that I hold dear and value. But inside each one of those characters is there's innocence in there somewhere, right? And and maybe, like you mentioned, humility, maybe having the humility to know if I had been born with their karma in the exact circumstances of their family lineage and their upbringing and everything that they experienced, I would probably be the same exact person, right? Because whatever made them, made them. So if I was them, it would have made me and I would be a Hitler or a Mao or whatever, right? So I, I, it helps me not feel in the position of a victim and not be afraid when I can sort of see their frailty through compassion. Where I kind of get stuck, and maybe you have some insight on this, is if I'm having compassion for a diabolical, maniacal, evil freak, (laughs) where's the line of enabling, right? It's like, can I unconditionally love a George Soros, but at the same time, stop them. You know, not like I have any power to stop that person, but you know what I'm saying? It's like the, you have a boundary, right? You have maybe even there's a righteous action or a discipline or a protection instinct, especially for me and my masculine parts of me is like, hell no, like I will kill to protect the innocent, right? Like all humans have that if we're aligned, but maybe, maybe more so in my masculine experience of myself. So there's that. Where does the compassion and the understanding and kind of zooming way out, where does that intersect with standing up for what's right and putting a stop to it and fighting? I, I don't know if you have an answer or there yeah, even yeah. is an answer, but it, it's something I kind of wrestle with as I go through waking up in the morning, looking at Telegram going, ah, I got to kill this guy or I'm afraid of this guy or this system as a whole, right? It doesn't matter who the face is. It's more about just the energetics of that sort of demonic anti-life entity that we call government you know right um so i go into i go into the compassion and the forgiveness and then i'm like but wait you know also someone has to stop them or do they yeah or do they exactly i've thought so much about this and i i've described it as the shadow of activism which is where a lot of the same resonant frequencies, if we want to call it that, of that which we as 
activists, especially in the like health freedom spaces, purport to dedicate ourselves to resolving, we are perpetuating. And what I mean by that is that when you insist that you know how reality should be, you are in a special privileged position to save those who need your saving. You need to inform the masses of what's going on and protect everyone. And I'm not speaking for men because I don't know. I, and I actually do think the roles may be different, but I'll speak as a, you know, as a recovering activist who is a woman, um, that I was invited to look long and hard at how I was re- literally propagating victim consciousness while masquerading as somebody who was here to resolve it. And the consciousness that says you are bad and wrong to literally anyone <laughs> is victim consciousness. That, um, that experience of our power through superiority is victim consciousness. And even in the like, you know, the exercise of compassion around like what might have happened to you, there's a superiority in that. Like you're, you're looking, looking from pity high. And, uh, yeah, yeah, pity yeah, and yeah, pathos. Yeah. You know, in family consolation, there's no forgiveness because you can only forgive from a place of superiority. There's just thank you. I love you. That's it. And trust me, I experienced the eye roll of the <laughs> spiritual bypass in like does anybody see what's happening? Right? Yeah, yeah. And I also now have a deeper understanding of what sovereignty looks like. And I, I do believe that mature adult psychology is synonymous with sovereignty in that it is non-oppositional and it's non-referential. That the immature masculine is the fuck no. And the mature masculine is the discerning, like, wise action right? Like, I don't remember where I once heard this, but it's like when when you have somebody who's just learning, a dude who's just learning martial arts, right? And he goes into a bar and he's like all excited about his new skills and somebody messes with him a little bit. Like he's going to like bust out all his moves and get all aggro or whatever, right? But when you have like a master, like a seasoned master, if he were in the same situation and somebody kicks him some vibe, like all he has to do is like literally turn his head glance at the dude and it's shut down like his literal presence is the contribution his attention is the contribution and i believe the masculine in each of us has that opportunity to mature such that our adolescent reactivity right our inability to hold in our systems without immediate discharge that which we do not approve of, right? Our experience of like, I don't like this is matured so that we can be with that and allow ourselves to have this strong spine so that we can simply navigate from our own beingness, right? Like it's not referential. That's why I call it the erotic caress of the enemy. There were times in my life where I literally, me and my colleagues were obsessively focused on that news, like, you know, chatter, like what's he doing? What's Gates doing next, right? That's it. That is a dynamic. It's an intimate dynamic. I see it in some of my critics, right? I'm like, are these guys masturbating about me every night? I mean, they're literally writing articles about me, blogs, podcasts. I mean, they're obsessed with me. (laughs) It's like, right? But it's that, it's literally that feeling of, right? Like, yeah, the little boy on the playground is like pulling the pretty girl's braids or whatever. And that's what we do sometimes as activists. We become, we we engage these dynamics perhaps so that we can re-experience that cardinal pain, that cardinal hurt, that cardinal fear, right? And we can experience it through like the false narcissism, the false inflation of like, now I'll show you I mean, when I wrote my first book, I had I was I was totally imbued with that energy. Like, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you down, bad daddy and mommy, you know. And I published a book with an exploding pill on the cover, and like had my sword aloft and thought I was gonna take pharma down single handedly. Well, pharma was, you know, for me that that bad parent and held all of the energies of the bad parent and became this surrogate partner through which I could 
enact and play out all of these fantasies that maybe I get to punish. That's funny. right. So when yeah. you're describing like, I just, I want to like take them down. I want to kill them or whatever. Like your inner villain, that experience of yourself as villain, you're in the triangle, dude. Like you're in the victim triangle as the victim and the villain and the rescuer, right? So you're all three at once. That's how we roll, you know, when we're in this awareness space, the activism space, you occupy all of the shades of, of that victim consciousness. And the rescuer for me is the, was the biggest one to shine a light on because, you know, not only in my activist life, but even in my personal life, if I had like a friend who, you know, is struggling with money, I couldn't hold her struggle in my body. So I would need to be like, I, 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 I'll take care of it. I got it. You know, here, here, don't worry. It's cool. And not only does that reify her own disempowerment and the sense that she can't figure it out on her own or she can't handle this, right? So I'm reifying her victimhood and then I'm hiding my disempowerment in rescuer, you know, clothing. And so... I think a lot of the opportunity that we have as we relate to what's going on in the world, you know, and, and I spent 10 years in that space of feeling like it was my job to inform the masses about how wronged we were and are and to save them from any experience of misunderstanding what's wrong, right? Or And then it became the, the news cycle of like, you know, people looking to me for my perspective on what's going on and what's happening in the world and like, you know, how to orient. And really it was always the, the virtue positioning, right? Like where does the good go? Where does the bad go? And, you know, for, for me, it was often like helping people see the story beneath the story. Like here's what they are up to, you know? And it was um, thanks to the pandemic that I decided to, it was around George Floyd time to really roll up my sleeves and go in instead of out and see, you know, how is it that I am that which I am condemning right now? Like, how is it that I hold the exact same energies? Like, is there such a thing as an evil person? You know, and at the risk of becoming a moral relativist, like I found that yeah, I I actually have been and am capable of doing all the bad things. All of them. Cheating, lying, killing, manipulating, like literally all of them. I'm not better than anyone. I am literally not better than anyone. And I'm not better than my former in, you know, versions of self, my asleep self. I'm not better than that version of me. You know, and so in recognizing. Um, that when I went inward, all of this orientation around power that I had enjoyed that said, I'm right, here's how we're wronged. Let me help everyone else see that. It led me to this place where I was able to meet like my inner villain, you know, my inner victim, and to orient around what's happening very differently. So these days, I don't take the bait. Like I literally don't know what's happening in the Middle East. I actually, I lit, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're my hero. Because I literally don't know why. And this happened with George Floyd. I never watched the video. Um, because first of all, I have a baseline belief that what is broadcast is heavily adulterated, CGI'd, crisis actored, and otherwise curated for a specific emotional effect, right? And it's called a loose ritual, that there is, there is a harvesting of a certain tenor of human emotion that is very strategically operationalized. And now, you know, everything, you know, with deep fakery, you know, there's all sorts of things. And I'm not implying that I know what's true or not not true. It's just that my baseline assumption until proven otherwise is that there is adulteration of actual occurrences and that when we are being asked to look at something, it's for a very specific reason. And it's not simply to share something that has totally. occurred. 
And the reason that I don't participate in um, dominant news cycles is because taking the bait is very easy once you have a story and a huge growing field, you know, of bad guy, good guy options, you know, to choose from. And it is the um, trap. It's the trap. When you think that someone is bad and wrong, but be that a government or an individual or a system, literally, you're in your disempowerment. And you're imagining that you can fix something on the outside instead of finding a way to orient towards your okayness that is already available and already present so that you can then discern without judgment, right? Discernment is the recruitment of your choice, you know, the power of your choice. You can discern and you can express your gift. You can express, you know, through wise action. And that's actually what I would like to be surrounded by is people doing that, you know, rather than imagining that they are in some sort of righteous position. And trust me, I have been there to, um, you know, impart their knowingness about how things should be. And meanwhile, playing directly into the hands of exactly that which they imagine they are going to ever win. It's a very adolescent energy. It's like the petulant teenager who's like, fuck you, I'm going to show you now, you know? And there's just such a different, you know, that's why I'm very sensitive to like hysterical men. Um, (laughs) I don't know. It's just, I can't with that. That's hilarious. I can't with that because... Don't go to any protests. Yeah, it scares me to be a woman in a world with hysterical men. You it know? should scare you. Um, There's probably nothing more dangerous than a man in a strong, capable body that is who's not it. emotionally self possessed, yeah. who's in his mother yeah. wound. You know, who doesn't know how to hold his emotional energies. He doesn't have that container and is just discharging them. Every There's a, something I thought about. I want to get your take on this, um, and it's around the idea of toxic masculinity. Yeah, I don't use that phrase. And uh, I don't either, except when I'm asking someone a question. (laughs) But when I think about what I think that means, and I'm not sure because it's not a vernacular that I kind of use, but it's something that's prevalent in the, the kind of limbic system fertilizer of the media and our culture, right? I think what they mean is a man who's angry, violent, oppressive, controlling, unthinking, unkind, right? And when I think of my experiences with men, and including myself at times, that have expressed in that manner, I I think that they're actually have been overtaken by feminine energy. (laughs) It's really like a toxic feminine within a male body, right? Because it lacks the stoicism and the control and the space holding and the breath and the strong spine and you know, the discernment over reactivity. When you see a guy freaking out and being violent or losing their temper, they're actually expressing the feminine energy. Totally. I've thought a lot about this you actually okay, because I'm not... sensitive to, okay. you know, that um, archetype and I'm sensitive to it because it's in me, right? Because my inner tyrant of a masculine absolutely had no room for my feeling states, right? Like, or it just was like, literally, if I could narrate the way my inner masculine would speak to my, you know, inner feminine, it would be like, who has fucking time for this right now? Shut up, deal with it. Let's go. <laughs> right? So like that inner tyrant um, needs to always find the the solution, the immediate, you know, way to discharge the emotion without anybody noticing is to find a solution. That's literally why I became a psychiatrist subconsciously, obviously, is because I had that little tolerance for my own discomfort with other people's discomfort that I needed to have a ready solution to their emotions so that I didn't have to feel them. Feel their emotions through me, right? (laughs) Those are called, you know, psychotropics, right? So here you go, take the Xanax. Here you go, take the Prozac. Like, here you go. I got the pill for you so that you don't have, and it looks like this is the rescuer, right? So nefarious. It looks like a, an altruistic impulse. I'm here to help you as a caring physician. And 
Of course, there's a layer of that in there. However, what was in many ways going on was like, I need you to stop suffering because I can't handle my own empathic resonance. Like it's too much for me. So please stop, right? That's, that is the immature masculine that cannot be around the feelings, right? Because they, they themselves have that relationship to feelings within them, right? And the feelings that need to be like histrionically expressed and demonstrated and shown and like narratively validated, that is the the unbridled immature feminine, right? That is like using feelings to get a certain thing. Not consciously, none of this is conscious, but, and so it's a match. It's like the both of them, <laughs> the both halves are, are immature. This is a really good piece right here for masculine energy people as, as a practice and something that, I don't know, I, I don't think I ever heard it anywhere. I just felt better to lean into it. But say in, in my relationship with, with my female wife, Allison, if she's experiencing you know, heightened emotions about anything, it doesn't have to be about me, I'll notice within me that I feel uncomfortable oh. with that. And I want to fix it and make her feel better because I care about her. Like you said, like there is, there is some real compassion in that as, as there was when you were a therapist and like, I want to ease her suffering, but there is definitely a part of it. It's not a big part. That's like, I feel uncomfortable because I can't help but take on her feeling state through that resonance. So I don't want to feel the discomfort of her discomfort. So I'm going to help her to, you know, move through it or whatever. And um Thankfully, I think through the, the awareness of that, of what the difference is between me being there for her and me being there for myself, is um, you know, using breath and presence to actually just be able to relax my nervous system and just hold space and release myself from whatever she's feeling. And this could be true of anyone. I'm just using her because she's the person I live with, right? But if you were having an emotional moment, there'd be a part of me that wanted to fix you so you feel better. Part of me that wants to fix you so I feel better. But there's maybe a higher path, which is and like... And that's a beautiful masculine expression. Like you are the problem solver. You are the fixer. We need you to do and be right. that. Right. However, if it's coming from a reactive place, it will have a certain quality that lacks true discernment, right? And if it's coming from a place of like self-possessed wise action and the spaciousness of like, I will bring the solution at the perfect time and guide us out of this place of your struggle and suffering, right? It will have a different quality and a woman feels that difference. We're wired to that. Absolutely. And your attunement to her is compromised if what you're really attuned to is your own discomfort. Mm -hmm. And you can only attune to her if you have these practices of cultivating presence, right? Cultivating self-regulation, cultivating like an inner um, stability, right? And that allows your own discomfort to swirl around. That's cool, yeah. Yeah. right? However, your attunement is to her. It's external, right? And that is the, um, the dominant perspective. It's outwardly attuned, because you have this on lock. <laughs> Whatever's going on in here is, doesn't really even matter. Um, but you're operating from like a study, right? That's like so much the warrior there's a, there's energy. There's a level too. when it's done successfully. <laughs> you know, it's a work in progress, of course. But, you know, when I lean into that and through practice, it, it becomes more <clears throat> automatic, right? You just kind of you go to, ooh, nervous system feels this way. What if I respond to my nervous system in this way? But there's almost, um, I don't know, I can't think of the right word. It's not, it's not detachment, it's non-attachment maybe, yeah. right? It's a detachment sort of infers that you're like, oh, I'm out of this, this conflict that you're having within yourself and I'm, I'm divorcing myself from it. But it's, it's more like a, a, a leaning into in a compassionate way, but also holding the realization that it's not my experience and it doesn't have to be my experience. And the craziest thing about that is if you're a fixer and you, you want to help someone feel better for whatever your motive is, 
as the masculine, what I've observed is the, I don't use the word stoicism or stoic. It's not even something I fully know how to define, but it just comes to mind. So I'll use that, right? But just breathing, space holding, stillness, openness, not trying to change, not trying to fix, allowing whatever needs to process, be processed through us or through the other person is actually the fastest way to the resolution, right? It's like you actually stymie the processing by trying to process it, right? right? And getting involved in, in, in the tussle of emotionality versus just yeah. holding space, breathing. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, we just moved through that. We and I didn't even do anything. All I did was just be, exactly. just this be is- in the deepest presence I can with an open heart, and all of a sudden, magically, whoever it is that is having the experience is it's resolved. Yeah. It finds its resolution through through non-action. Really, it's so interesting the way that works. My um, uh, polarity and BDSM teacher Om Rapani that I've been working with for a bit now, he talks about this in terms of containment, right? That a man's role, not only for, you know, his partner, but perhaps in society at large is to offer containment. And, you know, what he describes that as, if I could summarize, is that through his own system, he confers stability and grounding to the systems around him, right? That's literally it. So how do you cultivate that capacity as a man? Well, it's your journey, right? Whether it's through silent meditation or martial arts or yoga or whatever it is, you find your way to have such command over your system that you can gift it to the people around you and you you feel it. I mean, it could be that you know when to offer a hug or a firm touch, right? It could be a gaze. And it can simply be the way you are in a moment that offers safety <laughs> to the people around you. And when you think about the activists that you and I know, what men at the helm are offering that gift? <laughs> none that literally none that I that's a wreck my that brain I know. for that one. So if we're specifically looking at that, it's an energetic signature and it is a feeling. It's not right. If I'm a woman listening to one of these men, it's not an activation in my body. It's it's a soothing in my body where I finally feel like I can oh, like exhale. He's here. And yes. and but based on perception. It would appear that that person you describe is, quotes, not doing anything. Right. Right? It's just a presence. Yeah. And I think that presence is in many ways at odds with the activist impulse. Uh, you know, like, I, I mean, I certainly, we have friends here who I think embody that. Um, absolutely. And, you know, my... Um, friend and mentor and in many ways, like an important father figure to me, Tom Cowan is certainly somebody who I think of like, wow, he really helps a lot of people simply being in his stable system, right? And so when we look at that as being the the currency of the masculine gift that is conferred upon the populace, (laughs) it's a very different litmus that we assess who it is that we allow to guide us, right? And who it is that we choose to follow. And the um, the ways that we can orient around a man's feminine energy are probably because we ourselves, as I'm speaking as a woman, are in our own defensive structure, right? Data would call it like a masculine shell. Like I will orient around an enlivened, passionate man um, who does not seem to be able to offer that containment if I myself am in my own inverted right um polarity if i myself am disconnected from that deep desire to find my um submission right in the dynamic and you know amrapani and many others would say that it is the the deep desire of a feminine essence being to orient towards 
safety and containment conferring masculine energy to find submission and devotion in that space, in that sacred union. Um, And this is relevant to every man-woman relationship. This is the study I've made over the past couple of years. As I interested myself in ending the war with men, you know, and really acknowledging that a fear of being harmed and killed by a man was at the root of a lot of my activism. Um, I really dedicated myself to no longer speaking ill of men, to um, expressing appreciation and admiration and respect, um, to asking men for help, (laughs) you know, whereas my formerly conditioned, like, (laughs) I've got this, self never would have. uh, And it has brought about in me like a deep understanding um, as much as I'm capable of around the twist that men are in in this moment, right? Like trying to understand whether to feel their feelings or grab their balls, you know, like trying to understand what women want from them. Do they want apologies, right? Or do they want command, right? And dominance. And I think the new age has run quite a psyop on men specifically that has served their emasculation. And isn't that convenient? Because a population with emasculated, confused men and flailing, exhausted women is very easy to you know, co-opt. There's also the undermining of men through the fraudulent waves of feminism. Yeah, 100%. That have indoctrinated mothers who emasculate their boys. Yes. Maybe even with the best of intentions. Yeah, right? well, because they don't know better how to feel safe and meet their needs, right? So when a woman is raised by a scary, heart-disconnected man, right, she goes on to experience men as fear-inducing. And then when her son begins to express his healthy aggression, she makes it very clear that he will lose her love if he continues to do so, right? And that could be just being loud and you know, banging sticks on the wall or might be, you know, he bites her nipple while he's breastfeeding as an infant or it might be, you know, that he tries to stand up to her as an eight-year-old and say that he disagrees or doesn't like things, you know, in a certain way. And so what is it for, you know, sometimes called a shadow mommy or some other mother, right? Like, what is it for <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a woman, That's you know, funny, I've never heard that. Who, who just in service of her own system's regulation, like requires that her son divorce himself from his own eros, divorce himself from his own vital force, divorce himself from his own dark masculinity. You know, then you have a man who is a nice guy. (laughs) You have a beta, you have um, a man who will probably erotically seek out these mother-son dynamics where he is in equal parts still terrified of this woman and her reject capacity to reject and shame him and also you know desirous of that kind of hierarchical dynamic where he's empowered her and you know sometimes it's interesting to consider like what a boy wants from his mommy really is not the same thing as he wants from his woman as an adult whereas like what a little girl wants from her daddy is pretty much the exact same thing that she wants from her man. And so that... That's initially- interesting, you know, because it, it's, I think, probably more common that um, it, in, in a healthy way that a woman will refer to her man as like daddy or papa. But I, mean, like, I know for me, I would never be like, hey, mommy or something, you know, like I would never use that. I mean, the, I would never use that frame for my female partner. Yeah, know? I mean the the BDSM realm is a very powerful place within which to explore. You know, they call it incest play, but explore these dynamics. And the daddy daughter one is a big one. Um, and the the initiation that men seem to require is different than I think what women require to become. And perhaps that initiation that is not available in 
you know, the hegemony of American culture and really the disappearance of any sort of initiatory rights for men, say for, you know, sacred sons and what's being offered, you know, in, in contemporary models, the, the failure to initiate perhaps is how it is that men carry that uh, unerotic <laughs> dynamic into their modern day adult partnerships. Um, whereas if women do not initiate this, and that's not to say that women don't um, have an imperative to integrate their negative animus, right? Their negative father, their negative masculine projections. We certainly do. And that's perhaps the most important work we have to do is to really integrate, heal, mature our inner fathers, right? Our inner masculine. Um, but we don't need to initiate in the way that men do. And so we have a real problem and challenge, you know, when we have a society built on uninitiated men who are still fundamentally performing for the bad mommy that they long for love from and also deeply resent, you know, yeah. for, and, and they're ra rightfully rageful toward for her, you know, castration. Yeah. And the addiction to approval, you know, that's been a big thing for me is just shedding over the years. Um, the addiction to being liked and approved of and thought well of, you know, it's such a prison psychologically to feel like you need that all the time, you know, and find yourself sort of losing the grasp of your authenticity as the cost of attaining that. So yeah. it's a really, it's a really good, I mean, everyone says like, oh, I don't give a shit what people think. I mean, yeah, I think the most enlightened of us, like still care. Because of course, of the then we're social, social animals, 100%. Yeah, so, no, yeah, I don't buy that nobody cares, but I, I can say, thankfully, that um, as the years wear on for me, that I give less shits in terms of how other people perceive me, you know, but it's need, needing, like needing less, ne less approval, like. Yeah being able to reconcile that there are going to be a number of people throughout my life that uh, don't approve of me, don't like me, don't enjoy me, and being really comfortable with that, knowing that the people that do are my people and those that don't aren't, and God bless them, you know. But it's impossible to do that unless you've been initiated, whether it was, you know, in a formal rite of passage when you're 14 in a sweat lodge or whatever, or just through many dark nights of the soul. Um, you know, I think you can kind of um, acclimate yourself to not needing that to feel whole. Or maybe even more empowering is to interest yourself in the negative feedback, right? And to orient towards it, right? Like again, Omar Pani talks about like actualized men want to know the truth. They don't want to hide from it. You know, they don't want to like... Oh, don't, I don't need to hear your opinion. You know, they don't want to shelter themselves from disapproval. They want to know what actually the truth is because it gives them a refining mechanism. It gives them data. It gives them the capacity to develop intimacy with what I understand is one of a man's greatest fears, which is failure, right? How can you, you develop a dynamic with failure so that you are consciously interacting with it rather than imagining that you can run from it, escape it, or like somehow, you know, beat it. And so when you interest yourself in what your critics have, have to say, there's like such important data there. I mean, again, as a woman with an inner masculine, like I have found that I've grown my container for, you know, cause with the active, I mean, I've, I've been a very polarizing figure my whole career. And so when it was about my intellectual perspectives or scientific perspectives or perspectives on, you know, pharmaceuticals or germs or, or whatever, it's like that just rolled off my back, you know, like making the disinformation dozen list. Like I actually thought it was funny and I liked it. I enjoyed the, enjoyed the click juice after many years of censorship. So, you know, that, that didn't affect me at all was not like spiritual, um, material for me to alchemize. However, when I began to experience um, strong critical feedback from feminists, so-called feminists, um, actually when I began to talk about home birth, but also in my 
more recent exploration of the PSYOP of feminism. I've gotten pushback and then traditional man, woman relating, tons of pushback. And with my, uh, what I call desecreting my sexuality, meaning really integrating my sexuality into my public image, um, sharing videos of myself, you know, exotic dancing and pole dancing and, and, you know, a bikini on Instagram. I mean, these were things that were absolutely taboo for me as my identity had been constructed as a professional. And in doing that and receiving criticism, you know, a huge range of, of criticisms that were very, um, Ooh, cringe worthy for me, you know, from from like you're a terrible dancer to <laughs> like you're an attention seeking narcissist to you've like destroyed your career, you know, or like whatever you look like you have an eating disorder. I mean, just like a huge litany of critiques, constructive feedback. What I found when I, you know, because I'm I'm a fighter, I'm wired, you know, for for my stress physiology is fight. It's probably not surprising. And what I found when I would relax my body and open in those moments that I wanted to write the scathing, retaliatory, you know, comeback, um, was that I could meet the part of myself that agreed, you know, the part of myself that was holding the very same belief that I wanted to defeat. And so it's the micro of the macro we were discussing before. The war is inside, right? So how is it that thank you, you know, to my greatest hater, I can find the dimension of myself that would have waged war within, if not for this opportunity to see that it's there through the upset that they caused me, that they put upon me, but really was the the sentinel for me to interact with that part and interest myself in the part that believes I'm an attention-seeking drama queen, you know, whore, <laughs> whatever, you know? The part of me that actually does think they're right, that I am embarrassing myself or I've made a big mistake. And the part of me, I think the biggest, the biggest, hardest, um, meaning-making element that I encountered of all of the criticism was like, that I'm just like being a woman wrong. I'm just doing it wrong. The whole thing, right? I've got the whole thing wrong. And if there is a part of me that believes that, then I will be forever outside of my gift, right? Like forever outside of what is arguably the the antidote to nervous system dysregulation, which is self-expression. I, I will never be able to fully embody that if there is a part of me that is saying, you're not entitled to that. You don't know how you don't deserve it. You don't get the keys to the female castle, <laughs> right? And so inter- when I interest myself in my critics, there's a whole alchemy that becomes available and I become like mature in my masculine rather than remaining reactive, retaliatory, and vigilant, you know, in my immaturity, like within. And then I become a custodian, you know, for my my feminine energy in a way that is not available when I'm in that um, that place of seeking approval, which is hilarious, right? Like even that effort is is hilarious that I could please all the people. <laughs> I I made a video of Fanny on uh, that I shared on Instagram of like you know what it would look like if I like took notes on everybody's feedback and like tried to like do all the things they were asking, you know? And I start out like, you know, in like thigh high boots on my pole. And then I end up, you know, my white coat in a bun, in a burqa with tape over my mouth, you know, like typing on my computer. This is how everybody wants me. Is this good? You know, and it's funny, right? It's funny to imagine what we would be like if we took all the feedback, um, and tried to integrate that into some sort of coherent behavior. I mean, it's just not possible, so give it up. <laughs> yeah, and also, uh, you know, the value in not letting praise go to your head either, right? It's, I mean, it's the same coin. I forget who it was, but someone said, if you take the credit, you've got to take the blame. 
right? That neutrality of just <laughs> keeping all of that feedback right sized. And I guess in your case, you know, it can also serve as grist for the mill, you know? But yeah. And, you know, I, I'm sure you get this too, but, you know, I have people. No one ever criticizes me, by the way. <laughs> I'm talking about the accolades. Oh, okay, yeah. You know? I get a few of those. Yeah, people come have come up to me for years and shared just absolutely staggering like feedback about how I've impacted their lives and you know, thank you for this and thank you for that and it honestly I um it did, feels like very little um because I don't have that part in me that agrees. <laughs> so there's nowhere for it to land necessarily. Yeah. But where my risk of um, what in the Steinarian world is called like Luciferian inflation, like where the risk of that is for me is in like spiritual ego, right? So I like to give myself a lot of credit for my like courageous emotional work, right? So when I've had the, done the tough things, like had the tough conversations or, you know, come out you know, about these um, vulnerable things publicly or been more authentic, right, than was comfortable for me at the time. And and so there is, a, there is a space that I can get into where I really like credit for all my deep inner work, right? And I really want um, to be recognized for that. You know, it's not for my New York Times bestseller, my Ivy League education. Like, I don't actually, that does not go to my head, <laughs> right? It's, it's, this realm that I've really become interested in, like where my shadow lives there, because I think that it's a place in the spiritualized um, dimension of our culture right now where a lot of us can get caught up is imagining that we are really suffused with some important energy now that we see the truth, now that we've done the work, now that we've had the experience um, in that ceremony or in that circle. And uh, that is, um, it's like they say, you know, a light bright enough blinds as much as the dark, right? So um, I've really interested myself in what Steiner, to my best understanding, taught about this middle way, you know? So there's the luciferian energies of the transcendent rejection of the body right that a lot of you know kundalini or plant medicine or a lot of and even basic meditation seeks to offer is relief from the experience of your human body like come out here into the light um and find god there right and then there's the what he calls the aramonic forces and entities um, that are materially oriented, right? That's my whole all allopathic training. Like nothing to see here, soul wise, right? This is just parts and buttons and levers and chemicals. And this is a dense material realm. And we're meant to focus on what we can measure. Um, and, you know, somewhere in the middle is Christ consciousness, somewhere in the middle is God through. The material, right? God through the body, um, and how is it that we can stay in here and find our our humble access to this like enormous power? Uh, because I think that there's a lot of shadow on both both ends of that that spectrum, and that's why in the New Age community, I mean, we saw so many people, maybe all of the real talking heads, you know, shilling for the jab and the masks and whatever else, because the body, it's like a dirty realm of irrelevance. Right? Who cares? Yeah, put the mask on it. Whatever. We just got to make sure it doesn't get the gross thing and die. And experience the, the horror of death, you know, or whatever. Um, fears are, are hiding in that rejection of, of the embodied experience of, our humanity. And it's almost like they start to look just like the materialists, right? just like those who are saying like the body requires management and symptoms are something to be avoided at all costs. They're meaningless nuisance at best. And, you know, the, the portal to your demise at worst. So what's in the middle seems to be right, something that is um, a balance of 
all of this experience of transcendence and all of the really impulse to come down (laughs) into this very real space. When you describe the middle, which is where I aspire to exist (laughs) on a good day, because I've been to both sides of that, more so toward the you aren't your body, you're not your mind, therefore it doesn't mean anything, it's all consciousness. But when you describe that, the word that comes to mind is is non-duality, right? That it's it's not this or that, it's all this or all that. It's totally inclusive of everything, right? Because the measurable, the finite is real in its own light as is the unseen realms of the unmanifest. It's it's all the same thing. And I guess maybe if the pendulum that is our experience swings too much in the other direction, then we, we polarize ourselves, right? But there's a maybe a uni polarity right in the middle somewhere that we can kind of use as our North Star, which is that everything, and not oneness in the sense of like a new age oneness, but that there's only one thing and that it's consciousness and we exist at the center of that from our own experience, right? But that um, it's true that we're not the body, but it's also true that we are the body because here we are in it, right? right. So it's, it's, yeah. it's all real and it's all valid. Maybe that middle way is just the way I orient myself to that, I think is that, you know, trying to get myself out of a left or right or black or white or right. is or isn't, you know, it just, it just all is and somewhere in the, even though it's kind of an ambiguous position it's the one that feels best and seems to provide for me at least the most stability i think the resolution of the ambiguity though is in this in the opportunity that polarity offers right so i prefer that term to duality is is of course we're in a realm of polarities and what is the polarity that is specifically designed to cultivate you know the the creative life force you know that's conferred by god it's the masculine feminine polarity right it is this dynamic um experience of organized energies right because yin yang doesn't work <laughs> if it's all gray and muddied together right it's not a oneness yeah it's a very organized it's contained too. discrete uh, complementarity and that becomes available when we can understand how these dynamics operate within us, right? Like, how do I know when I'm in my dominant yang masculine energy? How do I know when I'm in my submissive invitational feminine energy? Um, can I feel that difference? Can I intend, right, to create um, the conditions for one to be more expressed than the other or to be in neutrality? Can I command that, right? Like that is an energetic mastery that I think then allows us to organize in polarity outside of ourselves and in dynamic with others, in dynamic with systems, in dynamic with nature, um, and to really leverage the, I don't know, intentional organization of energies so that we can come into complementarity. Because otherwise there's, there's just the, the warfare consciousness, right? There's just like, this is different, you're different, I'm bad, you're good, right? That, that you know, virtue split and we remain disconnected from our potential to access source. Do you think the world is inherently purgatorial? So I read this book called Exit the Cave. Um, can't say I recommend it. <laughs> like it was you know it's sort of a gnostic uh i don't want to like misrepresent um many of the important points in the book and i don't want to pretend to be an expert on it however for me it was at once validating of the suffering you know that i experience and that i see all around me and that we live in a world where animals eat each other things die things are destroyed um this entropic you know devolving (laughs) space that I can't seem to make too much contact with consistent contentment in, and I don't know anybody who is, right? So what, 
the fuck? <laughs> right? Like, what is this then? Right. And so are we being, um, is this sort of just a harvesting farm and are we being recycled here? And, you know, there's something that almost feels like, oh, finally, I'm being seen, right? I'm being seen. Almost the way I imagine many of my patients felt when they got their first psychiatric diagnosis. It's like, finally, somebody sees how fucked up, you know, my life experience has been and they've given me a label and that means it's valid. Um, however, I, I choose to see it differently. I, I feel very, in, like if I had a religion, it's, it's, you know, sovereign consciousness. If I had a religion, it would be to, to really polarize myself around what the victim resonance is and to understand its great power to appreciate it as a catalyst and to make sure that it's on that side of the yin yang line while I'm over here in another dimension, choosing to find, you know, the sacred in all of it, the beauty in all of it, to play the game of delighting, you know, in all of it and keeping that, that energy channel really open so that I can, you know, get a flat tire, experience a devastating loss that I can, um, you know, find myself in that, that pattern of my disappointment fetish and really just smile at it, right? And find a way to see um, why this is exactly how I wanted the plot to unfold. You know, like my kids speak, ba- I'm like learning a new dialect, having, I guess they're Gen Z, they're teen tweens, right? So they, like, they speak totally different language and I'm trying to keep up, <laughs> like trying to like learn the things. Um, and like one of the phrases I really love that's like coming from that generation is like, do it for the plot, you know, like just it's for the plot. It's because we love the story. It's like that Alan Watts lecture where he talks about like, if you could make up your dreams, right? Like the first night you'd be like fucking all these hot women and like eating all the delicious things and going on these like wild adventures of your design, by the seventh night, you'd be like, you know what? Somebody else write this. I liked it better that way. <laughs> right? Like pretending that we are like not choosing this. It's delightful, right? And the story is delightful. Like the story of our incarnation is something that can delight us even with its like devastation, you know, even with its like micro cataclysms. And for me, finding meaning is the end of my suffering, like when I can enjoy the narrative and I can see how this thing I hated was like exactly actually what I wanted. And um, Carolyn Elliott, now her name is Lovewell. Her work was very pivotal for me. She wrote Existential Kink and um, really opens up the exploration of how it is that our patterns of struggle are meeting our needs. Because I saw that with my patients. I saw like their chronic illness is actually meeting many of their needs. Like it's giving them an opportunity to set boundaries they couldn't otherwise set and say no in places and ways that they couldn't in their life. It's giving them an opportunity to feel cared for and attended to in ways that they couldn't ask for in other ways. You know, they feel validated um, in their struggle and suffering through their diagnosis, has an ICD-10 code, you know, and they feel like somebody cares enough to actually help them, right? And save them maybe even. Um, and rescue them and it's that childlike impulse and desire to finally have somebody you know there who cares enough um, to offer that level of assistance and attention. And you know, so she goes way beyond that to say, actually, like our patterns don't only meet our needs, but we derive like erotic arousal from our most loathe experiences. Right. And you can think about like if you get like a really triggering email, like, and you track the sensations in your body, like, can you find pleasure in the aliveness that you experience in your body as you're being triggered? I certainly can. And for many of us who have found a dissociative state <coughs> of numbness, you know, that's a lot of addiction is born of that vivification, right? The aliveness that's conferred 
through the unlocking of energies through, you know, substances or relationships or whatever. Skydiving. It is. Gambling, skydiving, you know, <laughs> you know, shopping. And, you know, that numbness is a hellscape. And so to find arousal in the best ways we can, sometimes it looks like, you know, continuing to attract financial scarcity, to continue to attract, you know, rejection and betrayal, to continue to be a match for, you know, loss so that you can have that inner experience yet again, right? And so how acknowledging that, owning that can expand the permission field to then consciously and intentionally create the conditions to choose that um, in a more self-informed way, right? Like how can you choose to feel arousal through other means? How can you um, move beyond your story? It requires that you acknowledge that you love it. You wanted it that way. And for me, that's been very empowering. Yeah. When I think about um, the challenges of life and the perception I have sometimes that this world that we enter into is a purgatory, the thing I find um, relieves me the most is the awareness or at least the hope that I believe that it's true that I chose to come here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I find that to be really empowering. It's I don't always fully believe it because I still feel like a victim um, at times. I mean, not in an interpersonal sense, but just we have to pay to live on the planet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what the fuck? Let's just start there, right? If I want to go sit out in that field, there's this superimposed matrix grid that has taken over the planet that tells me as a living man, as a living being that I have to give up my resources involuntarily under coercion and force to go sit there. Like, why would I ever choose that? Right. So that's like the victim side of it. It's like, oh God, I'm on a prison planet. And if you, you know, dig but then in, there's like the, why would I choose that? Yeah. If you dig into telegram too much, the world very much looks like that. Right. But then there's also the me that's sitting in the field going, yeah, man, I, I picked this because it provides me with the um, uh, opportunities to evolve as a spirit, as a soul. And if I came here and it was not purgatory and there wasn't at least part of it that was hell, then there would be um, no contrast to work with, right? It's like if, if you came here and it was utopia and perhaps there are other dimensions or even other planets that are, that as people that have asc- souls that have ascended this level, maybe you move up like Mario Brothers and you, you know, <laughs> It's all love and light and you exist as an etheric being and you know you help us poor souls down here on earth as a guardian angel or whatever your role might be. But the fact is that I'm here, I'm in this body, I'm in this world where I have to pay to be in this world or else I'll be imprisoned or punished or threatened with violence, right? So Right, but beneath that complaint, yeah, that very victim y complaint, yeah, is desire. And desire is your erotic connection to God. It's your feminine channel, right? So what is the desire that is born through that no? What is the yes? You get to make contact with that yes. You get to live into that yes. You get to claim that yes. You get to exercise your power of choice that literally no one can ever take away from you because you always have the choice to narrate what is happening. Even if somebody's sawing your arm off, right? You can narrate it. You can choose to perceive and respond to what is happening, right? So so the desire and the birth of the desire cannot happen without the no. The yes wouldn't exist. That polarity is the nature of this realm. So to access the yes without the no, it ain't a thing. The yes and (laughs) the desire and the yes to me if I could put it in really Flintstonian, <laughs> really Flintstonian narrow uh, narrative, is like I, I chose to be as a as a single expression of consciousness or God, right? A part of God, but a unique and differentiated expression of God. I chose to be flung out into the field <laughs> and to separate as much as I could from what created me or, or what I really am, right? Only to birth the desire to work my way back to the place from which I came, right? That's kind of seems like what the game is or the cycle is, is like, cool, yeah, I've separated 
so that I can gain the wisdom or evolution that's inherent to what it takes to claw your way back to source. It's like source plays this game with itself, like just infinite expressions of itself and all its permutations. And then everyone's kind of left out there in the field going like, what the fuck happened? Where am I? Right. You know, am I in hell? Am I in purgatory? Yes. And no. Yes. If that's what you believe it to be. No. If perhaps you can, as you said, find that desire and find the yes, which is like, okay, I'm going to hike my way back. You know, I'm going to find a map and I'm going to get lost many times on the way, but I'm going to keep finding my way back to my true north and and find my way back to source. You know, when I look at it from that perspective and take ownership of the decision that I made to come here to this place, knowing exactly what it would be and the circumstances by which I would enter, the mother and father that would be my portals, if I take responsibility for that, I find life is is much more easy to gamify (laughs) and I feel less victimized by my experience of being here. You know, right. And then you have an experience of adversity and you can orient towards it sometimes within seconds, sometimes reflexively with curiosity rather than with the disempowerment of rejection, right? Rejection of what literally is. <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah. here. You can have a tantrum all you want, yeah. but this is the deal. It's happening. It's happened. It is happening. Right. And sometimes I remind myself when I'm relating to desire from an immature place and I'm feeling petulant and impatient and I want it now or yesterday and it's not here. And I remind myself like, oh, I'm actually living already the life that I'm afraid that I will have to live. I already don't have the thing. I already don't have the thing and I'm okay. (laughs) So the worst has already happened. I already don't have the thing. And that's why the biggest lie we tell ourselves is that like, it's going to stay this way. It's going to stay this bad, this horrible. And like, I can't handle it. When I worked with suicidal patients, which was probably a good third of my practice at any given time, that was the big lie they told themselves was like, this particular signature of not having what I want, right? Or living in the absence of some feeling forsaken, living in the absence of... um, any sort of uh, connection to anything that matters, right? This is going to go on forever. It's just going to be like this. This is what new parents tell themselves, right? Like in those early days of infancy, it's like, oh my God, am I, this is what it's going to be like, you know? And it's a rejection of the dynamism that is the foundational nature of this realm. It's just change and change and change and change all the time. So why would we imagine it would ever stay quite like this, right? unless we want to really sink into that realm of futility where then we just kind of give up. It's a nihilistic space and it kind of feels good, right? All of these spaces we say we hate and we think we hate, there's, there's pleasure in there. And I think until we acknowledge that, then we are, it's like we're in this schizoid realm of pretending that one side of us doesn't see the other side and they can't have a dialogue and they can't meet face to face. Um, that's why I've gotten so much out of parts work because it's really offered me an opportunity to bring into, um, intimacy, awareness, discussion, these dimensions of myself that are, are really in like sibling rivalry of the utmost proportions. Right. And so once they at least see each other and start to understand the motives of the other, then I can be, you know, me with my capital S self, I can be the directress, you know, I can be the one who is really um, master of ceremonies and organizing everybody, which is all they've ever really wanted. Like, is anybody home here? You know, uh, I need a break (laughs) from my duty as protector inside. How has your, this is the last thread that we'll we'll go down and I'll, I'll let you go. I always, I always love talking to you. I we feel like three hours is nothing when we have a conversation. Uh, how has your, I guess, recent journey and just, you know, your worldview as you're describing it here today, how has that impacted your being a mother? How do you relate? Mm. How do you relate to their, your kids? How do you, 
discern how much of your worldview you want to impart on your kids and how much you allow them to just have their own experience and so on. So I made the choice to kind of get more sober, I guess, as I told you, in January of this year. And um, it wasn't because I had experienced any consequences of like socially drinking. I wasn't because I had like some inciting event. Um, And I can't say I've experienced any like physical changes or benefits. And I can't say I've experienced any like social benefits. There's like, my life has gotten kind of small as a result. Um, And where I have recognized this is why I did this is in my mothering. And I actually did a whole, I have a recorded workshop called Victimless Mothering, where I summarize like how it is that I recognize, especially as like, you know, a holistic mama, like especially as someone who just passionately wants to end cycles for my daughters that I have perceived to exist in my mother line for many generations as a woman who feels like I know what their beautiful bodies require in terms of food and protection and, you know, optimization and especially wanting to like pay forward all of these gifts of my awakening. I really saw the same energies of abuse and the same energies of unattuned hierarchical dominance, um, the same energies of conditional love, and the same control-based and fear-based impulses that informed all of those cycles I thought I was ending. And it was like through the holistic grid, right, of, of needing them to eat a certain way, right? Don't order the gluten at the restaurant, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. And needing them to get on the page about tech and, you know, using the Ethernet cord instead of the Wi-Fi. And- You're describing my future as a <laughs> <laughs> Watch my workshop, brother. Oh, <laughs> I, I really feel like if I could have watched my own workshop, if I could have listened to my own self, of course, I wasn't ready for it. And, and you could say they chose this and this experience. Um, I think I would have seen it. Like, because it just felt like this reveal, like, oh my God, I'm doing the same thing. I'm offering conditional love, except now my conditions are around health and wellness, right? And I, um, I started to see it trickle in, in little opportunities that my daughter's offered me, you know, like we were traveling in Mexico and my, um, my daughter wanted to order this pasta, right? In Mexico. But it's like this restaurant that has amazing pasta. It's weird in Mexico, but whatever. I've been there before. So I'm like, oh, this pasta is so good. And they have gluten-free pasta as they do, you know, these days. And so the waiter's like, you know, the, the gluten-free is going to take like 45 minutes because we don't like have it ready. And we had like actually traveled that day and that just seemed unappealing. And I could feel in my now more sensitized system, I could feel that she was trying to access me to sense whether or not it was okay with me that she ordered the regular pasta. You know what I'm saying? Like it was just in a second and I could feel the whole thing that she was like, oh, mama doesn't want me to order the regular pasta, but I want to order the regular pasta, but I'm not allowed to. And if I do do that, then mama's not going to love me as much. It's like literally in these mundane details, right? Where if if she, like, I've, <laughs> I've found like conventional candy hidden in my kids' rooms. Like I've seen <laughs> their, you know, because I love, we're all about like makeup and beauty. And, you know, so of course I have all the clean brands and, you know, I remember one time I saw like a, what's it called? Like aqua four, aqua something. Anyway, it's like a petroleum based thing. And I, one of my daughters had it in her purse and I was like, what is this? You can't have that. Right. But that impulse is control. Love does not look like that. It doesn't look like that. That's so hard. So in that moment, I felt that and I turned around and I said, Amore, you can, you can order the pasta. It's totally fine. 
and it wasn't totally fine in me. <laughs> but I decided that it was more important for me to, at this age, okay, she's 14, you know, at this age to acknowledge that her own bodily sovereignty is something that she requires training in her sovereignty, right? And so because there's not an initiatory ritual, at what point do I hand the damn baton to her? If what I'm trying to teach her is you own your body, right? It's a sacred temple and you are the one who feels into your yes and your no. You should never do anything that you don't want to do. Well, at what point is she in charge of that, right? And not me. That's an interesting question. And so you just feel it as a mother. I think you just feel the moment Actually, it wasn't that moment. It was when she asked me for an iPhone. That was the moment. Um, and at the time, I was off my iPhone. I was off my iPhone for two years. I remember that. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you saw me on my little yeah, and then dorky at some, gadget. At some, at some point, yeah, I think I texted you and it, I was, look, it, it was an iMessage or something, yeah. you know, and I was like, oh, she's in normal. Because I think before it. it had to be Telegram oh or God, whatever. Oh my God, no, it was. it's the whole thing. I thought it was cool. I was like, damn, respect, girl. I, I wish I could... Well, it, it served me because it allowed me to come into a dominant relationship to the technology where now like I interact with my iPhone, I enjoy it, I use it, there's no shame. Like it's not like I'm not its bitch. <laughs> like it's mine, you know? Like it's just there was a, a flip. Um and I got back on it because of her. <laughs> Because she asked me for an iPhone and at the time I was like, we don't do that. Look at me. I'm not doing that. You're not doing it either. You know, kind of a thing. And I just felt this was a big moment. And she said something like, Mama, at this stage, I know what works for me. Nice. She was 13 at the time. Right. And I just felt like it's happening now. I can stay connected to this. I mean, it makes me cry like this. <laughs> Angel, you know, or I can just do the same damn thing over again. That was done, you know, in my mother line, which is like just powering over because I'm afraid and I need to be right. And I need to like align around my narrative being right. And um, thankfully, I have amazing, you know, women in my life who are able to help me orient, you know, around how important it was to just give her command of her own experience. Plus, she's like, such a baller. Like she literally has her own money and has had her own jobs and like she could buy her own shit. So like what power do I really have? You know? And she um and she has an iPhone now. <laughs> and and I still make them put it put their gadgets away in the car and at 9 p.m. And at least I own it. You know, it's not an agreement. It's a rule. Like it's something that makes me feel better. Right. So where is it that I'm parenting from a place of my own self-regulation and soothing? There are still places like that that make me feel better. Not many, but the tech is a, is a tough one. That Because to watch a generation stare into screens, I don't need to tell you, you know, like it's harrowing. It's harrowing. And it's perhaps what they chose. They chose to come here now. This is the deal. This is what's going on. You know, we're in the awkward generation that's like bridging to... Um, experiences of the outside versus the inside versus the virtual world. But I've come to many places where, okay, like <laughs> my kids chose to go to school, right? So the ethos in my household has has been that the, every woman does what she wants. My daughters do what they want 100% of the time. And so do I, right? And so when we when we have conflicts around that, it's always through the efforting towards complementarity, right? So how do we find a win-win here? It's not sacrifice. It's not, it's not um, you know, somebody violating their own needs. And it's really, really worked. It's really worked because now we all know that when we're doing something, it's because we really want to be doing it, okay? So they chose to go to school. I'm an unschooling advocate, okay? They chose to go to school. Like public school? Well, initially, this private school um, and then they decided they didn't want to be there anymore. And my one daughter chose to go to a Catholic school wow. and my other daughter chose to go to a public school. And I mean, the fact that my you know daughters are willfully warehoused in you know Rockefeller indoctrination camps 
Oh, that's a tough one. Oh For me God. to swallow, as so you can I'm, imagine. I'm sweating over here just th- <laughs> thinking about it. not even my damn daughter. <laughs> exactly, I'm right? Like, Hell no. At, at, with all that we know, with all that we know, oh that's God. what's happening to like these like literal like <laughs> deities in my household. Okay. So given that they are choosing this, my... um assertion was that I was going to do Kelly school, I call it, right? So I'm going to do Kelly school and I'm going to teach them about all the truths that I know. I'm going to teach them about how to think and logical fallacies. And I'm going to teach them about psyops and I'm going to teach them about history. And I'm going to teach them about the nature of this realm. And I'm going to teach them all these things for an hour every other week on a Sunday. (laughs) And that was our agreement. And I did it for like the better part of a year and a half and attacked like the big myths about, you know, government and germs and the globe and whatever else. And, you know, finally, my my youngest started to tell me she didn't like it. She doesn't want to do it. And oh, I got wow. all reactive about that <laughs> and was like, well, this is our agreement. And, you know, you're being literally brainwashed. And I think it should be countered by something else. Meanwhile, they know. They know. I live my beliefs. They know. The contagion isn't a thing. They know that. They've been raised this way already. It's already in there, you know? Like, I don't need to force things they're not interested in down their throats. And she said, Mama, you always tell me that I shouldn't do things I don't want to do. And here you are having me do this thing. And she said, and then when I tell you how I feel about it, you make it about how you feel about how I feel. Damn. And I was like, oh. What a teacher. (laughs) Wow, that is a real demerit. That's the demerit, is making how your children feel about how you feel about how your children feel. That's the relationship to merit. Like that's like the thing that that is not connection, love, or intimacy, right? So that hit me pretty hard and I ended Kelly school, right? So these moments where I was able to see how I was using my children as narcissistic extensions to stabilize my sense of self-identity and inner security, I would not have been able to explore if I was literally even having a mezcal on a Friday with a girlfriend. And I don't know what that connection is, but that's what I have experienced in my sober life is a deeper capacity to look at my fear that I've failed as a mother and to own how it is that I am passing on in very covert ways through spiritual, holistic, wellness-oriented impulses, the same control-based, you know, abusive tactics of power over and not seeing these beings in front of me, not seeing these women. I mean, they're women, you know, like not seeing who they are, allowing them their sovereignty and knowing when it's time to pass that baton, knowing and sensing and feeling like it's no longer my role to protect them from themselves. It's actually my role to help help them keep that channel open of self-attunement, of embodied um, sensory navigation, right? And that uh, it's very humbling, but there's so many reflexes that we otherwise engage of like, you owe me respect, like you... I know better than you. I have more experience. And here I am like showing you how to live. You know, it's one thing if they ask you for help or they express interest in something. And it's like a very different thing when it's just so that you feel better. And now I feel not better all the time in support of their doing their thing. And, you know, I'm not going to like get super into this just out of like, respect for privacy, but like understanding how to relate to daughters around sexuality is like a whole thing, right? And I think of myself as like a very sexually informed and liberated woman in many ways. And the reflexive like, when you're with your boyfriend, the door needs to be open, like kind of a thing. Like, really? Why? Right? And I've been called out on that, right? Like (laughs) basic bitch parenting, as she called it. (laughs) You know, and I could receive that and really look at it and be like, you're right. Like, what am I? 
worried about? I've been teaching you about sacred anatomy and sexuality since you were like literally five. Like, what is it that I'm actually trying to control here? It's just an unconscious reflexive, like sex is bad. I don't think it's bad. Why am I acting as if it's bad, right? Like, what is that? What is that? You know, so now I have, I have policies that uh, you know, make a lot of other adults uncomfortable. Um, and by policies, I mean like an understanding and agreement, you know, with my daughter. And that is also something I wouldn't have been able to really explore because it might have meant that I was wrong about my initial impulse as a mother. And that might have meant that I failed as a mother. And to fail as a mother is, is, is something too devastating. You know, it's like why so many mothers cannot hold the adult expression of their children's narratives of the dark, abusive experiences that they had in their childhood with that very mother, right? They can't hold it because it means that they are bad and wrong. And when we grow our capacity to hold the experience of someone, we love seeing us as bad and wrong. I call it wearing the villain crown, you know, then sovereign love is available. Then they get to have their experience, you know, and to wear the villain crown as a parent, it takes something. It takes something. And it's pretty much your only responsibility is to not, you know, we, I remember we talked about this last time, but to not impose your narrative on your child without their consent, willingness, and availability for that, because that is, um, it's dark dominance, right? And it's not ending any cycles, even if it's because you think eating the pesticides and the gluten is like a really bad thing. And listen, my kids are teen tweens now. So I've had all those years of feeling really comfy and cozy in my very rigid food boundaries with them. And at this point, I'm like, okay, they can do their thing. But when when might I have started to loosen up had I had the capacity to do so? I don't know. I mean, maybe there is a good 10 years where it helps for you to hold that line. Maybe not. I think it's very personal because it's a feeling inside of yourself of where is this coming from, right? And is it like a sacred protection or is it just, you know, reflexive yeah, control? Because yeah. what if we're wrong about these things, <laughs> right? Like if the, the, the game I played with myself is like, okay, what if like we're actually wrong about EMF? What if we're wrong about, you know, processed food being so bad? What if we're wrong about like, you know, blue light. Yeah. What if we're wrong that's about my, these that's things? My big one. Okay. We think we get it now and we think we even have like scientific evidence to support it. But like, what if we actually had it wrong and we entered a belief field of victim consciousness that said this bad thing is happening? You got to protect yourself and you got to get other people to be worried about it. Otherwise, no one's going to be okay. Okay. That's a victim consciousness field. Okay. Fine. But what if we were wrong about it? And then I look at my behavior. Would I feel remorse? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how can your behavior around wellness and holistic parenting come from a place where if you were wrong about the things you're so sure you're right about being bad, right? I'm so sure I'm right that processed dairy and gluten is bad. I'm so sure I'm right that GMOs and pesticides are bad. I'm super sure that I'm right, that radiation and, you know, cell phone exposure is bad and very, very sure that, you know, public schooling is problematic, right? But like, let's just play the thought experiment. If I wasn't right, it turns out it was wrong. And I just looked at the play, the movie of my behavior, would I feel remorse? And how can I express the impulse that is like, I've learned this thing it's actually really inspired. That's where you find the yes. If you don't find the yes, you're just in the no. You're passing on the no to your kids. Nobody wants that, right? It's like, so like, how do I inspire like what it is to be in this awareness? If I can't do that, then who knows if it's actually even coming from the right place or if it's just part of that grand louche ritual that has all of us truthers and health advocates and activists like in the field of disempowerment thinking that we've figured out the thing that has set us free you know when we really have just built a new prison i don't know it's like a really 
uncomfortable place to have landed. Um, and I trust that there's something very uh, important that is coming through the portal of my softening in these ways. It resonates with me. I dig it. It's terrifying, <laughs> but I dig it. I mean, I can see as, of course, you know, in a self-referential way, even not having kids, I see the way that I attempt to control the experience of people I love. Yes. And, and, and some of it is because I love them and I, I want the best for them. Probably more of it is my own fears that express as the desire to control other people. You know, which, as we know, usually has the opposite effect if anyone has any self respect. <laughs> you know, just be like, you want me to do what? Well, fuck you. I wasn't going to do the thing. Now I'm going to do it just because you don't want me to. You know, yeah, that's great. Well, man, it's been uh, a pleasure as always. Uh, yes. Yeah, as you speak, you know, it's just summoned so many great ideas and so much expansion for me. And I'm sure the many people that will hear this. Uh, before we check out of here, what do you got going on? I know you you have a podcast now. You mentioned um, an online course you have. Give us you know give us a pitch so people can go get more Kelly Brogan. <laughs> and uh, and by the way, guys, you can do so at lukestory.com slash brogan. And we'll also link to Kelly's prior episodes, which would have been uh, number ninety one and four hundred four, respectively, both of which were uh, equally enticing conversations. So you can find everything there. But what do you what do you got going on? Awesome. So yeah, like I said, I'm dipping my toe slash throwing my whole naked body into um, the live event space. So I have an event, which depending on when people are listening is in November, uh, the beginning of November in Miami. And I'm inviting um, to, to present, I was going to say to speak, but see, it's not speaking. <laughs> it's singing and dancing and working through creative blocks and um, shame alchemy and family constellation and all the tools that have um, helped to expand my permission field to be a woman I never, not only never thought I could be, but I actually um, fiercely condemned and judged like these aspects of myself in other women. So the resolution of my sister wound, as I would call it, has allowed me to recognize that I have permission to be that which I judge. You know, I have permission to be... Um, expressed in ways I didn't think were okay for me or I thought I would be punished for. And in ways, you know, I kind of have been, but when you come together with other women in a field of belonging, you can experience the permission granted in like a moment, and then you have it for life. I mean, I have a pole dance teacher who literally in one session with her gave me permission to tap into my sensuality in ways that I would have like awkwardly giggled my way into my inhibited dimension of like, oh, that's not for me. It's okay. Like, I don't know how to like, just like walk around a pole to music. That's for you. Okay. And formerly I'd probably always like judged women who wore that much fluidity and sort of languid um, softness in their bodies, like as being like slutty or I don't know, unprofessional or whatever I would have said, right? <laughs> and so these women, That's yeah, funny. that was like a big one for me. These, <laughs> you know, these 10 women like held a handout in the dark to me. And I want to offer that experience to other women and myself. Honestly, it's going to be amazing. I was saying it's like the wedding of my parts. It feels like it feels like a marriage um, ceremony and celebration of like all my dark and light parts. Um, so that's cool. And um, yeah. And then I, you know, continue to have available my, my health program full of all sorts of health rules. <laughs> yeah. For people who willingly enlist. For people in those who willingly roles. enlist and want to initiate their, their masculine in such a way that they recognize they do have choice, they do have the capacity for a follow through and um, commitment and discipline and devotional self care on a level that we sometimes dabble in in the health and wellness space. And, you know, that initiation, I didn't recognize as being what it is, um, you know, through Vital Mind Reset, through my program now as the, as a masculine initiation practice, practice for people, like for women and men, but really like, how do you bring that spine online? And interestingly, I think looking back on my practice, like I've held that father archetype for people, right? Like, gazing into the eyes with a knowing that you've got this, like you can do this, like 
push yourself. And that's not always an appropriate archetype, you know, to weave in. And um, sometimes it's exactly what's needed. So yeah. And then I have a podcast now. Um, It's certainly not as fancy as this one, but it's called Reclamation Radio. And it's been really amazing. I mean, I've enjoyed more censorship-free expression on that podcast than any other medium I have. Uh, I don't know how or why it is, but I say whatever the fuck I want. I find it strange too that this, and I don't want to jinx it, knock on wood. I I mean, because in Canada, they've just announced they're going to start regulating podcasts and have them register with whatever their version of the FCC is and all that shit. I'm like, oh, here they go. They're doing a trial run. But yeah, it, it, it has been interesting through all this. I mean, I've had a few videos RFK Jr., David Icke, you know, controversial people have been removed from YouTube, the video part of it, but I never really had any problems. Again, knock on wood. And for you demons listening, if you are, leave me alone. <laughs> I'm trying to do good work here, man. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun, right? You it's kind of feel like, I don't know why, maybe we're kind of under the radar in this realm, you know? Yeah. And Reclamation Radio, uh, do you... Do you do more solo cast or yeah. guests? Or? It's mostly me talking about what's what's alive for me, which has been a lot of um, really beginning to reorient around feminism, uh, around oh, yeah. man-woman relating, around um, healing these inner and outer polarities. And interestingly, a lot of my content, you know, I just recorded one called The Reclamation of Courtship, uh, about what it is to say no to premarital sex, <laughs> all right? And just all these funny spaces I find myself in having tried on other um, costumes and really foregrounding like traditional marriage values and the covenant. And I don't know. I mean, it's just so funny how I like to play in these different arenas, but that's a lot of what I talk about um, you know, BDSM and (laughs) the gamut. I was talking to somebody last night who's like an older gentleman here and he was talking about how much he loves my podcasts. And I was like, well, you're not really my avatar. (laughs) You're not really my like a target audience. Um, And he's like, yeah, sometimes I blush when I get into some of the material I think I'm not supposed to be hearing. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) otherwise it's super interesting. So yeah, it's been fun. Cool. Awesome. Well, I encourage everyone to check it out and I'm going to do the same. I've I've seen it in my feed, but I haven't listened to it yet. So I'm going to check it out. Yeah. Well, Kelly Brogan, thank you so much. It's always a blast. Such a pleasure to talk to you, man. Yeah, it's it's so fun. We always just have a really great banter. And the banters that I appreciate the most, I think, on this podcast are ones that um, have me walking away in contemplation, Mm -hmm. right? There's ideas where I go, oh, wow, I never looked at it that way. And that's really fun. And you always provide that. So thank you. You're super open and open mind and heart. And it's easy. Mm -hmm.